everybody. Welcome to Presence. I am Doug King, and today we're going to finish the conversation about why sin does not exist today. Uh, and it's part of an overall discussion of the most confusing story told over a 2,000 year period by a world religion. And it is Christianity's story about law and grace. That, of course, will relate directly to subjects like salvation, a destiny of heaven versus hell, and so on and so forth. Now, as I go into this today and finish up this discussion, one of the things I'm going to start bringing in today is the difference between progressive Christians and fundamentalist Christians. And what I mean by that is I'm having some really good positive discussions with progressive Christians that I cannot have with fundamentalist Christians. And that's because progressive Christians themselves cannot have conversations with fundamentalist Christians. And in fact, isn't this why those of you that consider yourself progressive Christian, isn't that why you use that term to distinguish and, and make sure that people understand you're not fundamentalist Christian. Along the way, as I discuss this, I'm going to show that sin and the belief in sin is an overall problem within the story told about law and grace and God identity. And you're having a real problem as a progressive Christian. I know this because I've talked to you for decades. I know you have a heart for the universal. I know you have a heart for all people on this planet. And I know that the fundamentalist interpretation is an interpretation that now is causing a lot of heartburn, a lot of difficulty for those of you who see a more progressive Christianity. However, the other point I'm going to make is that when you identify yourself as Christian, you are still in the same system, the same form that is the root of the problem to begin with. And so what we're proposing at present is that we keep the Christology, which I have, even though I've never been in a church building for going on 25 years. I have a passion for Christology. But it's because I see Christology is the universal action of God. What? To do what? To reconcile the world, to restore all things. And it has nothing to do with Christology being a religion. I don't believe it is. And that's part of a bigger conversation that we've been having for a long time. This idea of sin and death, though, is an idea that is more and more disturbing to progressives, especially when you walk into an interfaith meeting and you're claiming to be Christian, but the story you draw from has a lot to say about sin and sin and death. How does that apply to those people in other world religions? Are they sinners because they are not Christians? What is it that is sin? So what I'm going to do is uh, pick it up here with Paul's description of what is sin, what is the root cause of sin. And what I mean by that is sin is often confused by its symptoms, killing, murdering, fraud, immorality. Those are symptoms but they're not the cause. The root of sin has a singular cause, and Paul is going to talk about it in the passages that we look at and explain it to the followers of the first century. Unfortunately, when Paul and Jesus and the others left the scene, all the teachings, gospels, apostolic writings, John's revelation, it was all left in the hands of the Roman government. And what they understood was purely in light of religion, world religion, empire, institution. 
And you know, if you're a progressive Christian, that we've had many discussions, you and I, about the problem of institutionalism. It all goes back to these teachings, and that's why we need to get back into the text, because the text has the answers. Most progressives I've talked to are trying to get away from a lot of the text because they think the text actually supports what the fundamentalists are saying when they go through book, chapter, and verse. And I'm saying when you go through book, chapter, and verse, you do not come out a fundamentalist Christian, and you don't come out a progressive Christian either. That's not God's story from the beginning. So I'm going to keep that conversation going. So those of you that are progressive Christians, thank you for hanging in there with me, and thank you for considering or even thinking about that there could possibly be something greater, something bigger, more inclusive, than the world religion called Christianity. You've got a great heart for all the things you want, peace and unity. So I'm encouraging you as we go along to think about why there's not peace and unity in the world religion, Christianity. Instead, it is a model of division and paradigms of separation. But that's because everything is developmental in nature. At one time, we were all out killing bulls and goats and taking the blood and saying that our sins are forgiven. <laughs> Have we come a ways from those types of things? Yes. Does it make sense that there's yet a bigger God ahead, a bigger Christology ahead? We're saying, yes, we believe there is. So, per usual, I'll go to the text. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave the screen myself and I'm going to move on to my uh, text for today. And I'm going to share it and pull it up. And it's coming from Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Let's get into it. Paul is trying to explain something that, again, was not understood uh, by those who took control of the biblical narrative in the Roman Empire. And it's been passed down in every Christian religion denomination today. So what is, what's Paul going to tell us about sin? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. So the law itself is not sin. It's not, it's not sin to say you, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal. That's not sin. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Okay, so here again, sin has something to do with law, the law, and law itself. This is why in other places Paul will say, the sting of sin is death, and the strength of sin is the law. The law is the strength of sin, but it itself is not sin. What is he talking about? How, how is it that we parse this out? Because we, we must. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So Paul is saying, look, the law has a purpose. I wouldn't have known right from wrong. I wouldn't have known it's wrong to murder. It's wrong to steal, bear false witness, and so on and so forth. Those things are wrong. I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law hadn't said, you shall not covet. So the law was a guide in terms of right and wrong. And it played a necessary role and function then. It plays a necessary role and function now in the sense that we still have law. So what's the problem? And why did Jesus even need to come to move humanity into a system where sin did not exist? How is that possible if we still have law? 
All right, let's keep going and what we're looking at. But sin, sin is a thing in and of itself. Sin, seizing an opportunity by the commandment. What commandment? An opportunity by the commandment, singular. The commandment, you shall not covet. Sin took an opportunity, saw an opportunity by the commandment, you shall not covet. What, what, what happened? It produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now, why is that? Well, Paul says, because apart from the law, sin lies dead. You have to have laws, requirements, conditions in order for sin to operate. And we'll talk about that more as we get into Christianity, because all the Romans did in the first century was come up with another world religion with its own laws, and those laws are referred to as dogma, doctrine, creed, and the following of those doctrines, dogma, and creed are used to determine whether or not you are an acceptable Christian or you are not a true Christian. And then, of course, the question is, if you're trying to distinguish inside your own world religion, how do you go to that interfaith meeting and talk to people that are not part of Christianity itself? They don't follow dogma, doctrine, and creed of the Christian world religion. These are things I want us to think about as from the progressive Christian standpoint. Paul makes this statement, I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, what commandment? You shall not covet. Sin revived and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Paul is saying he was motoring along under the law. And in fact, he said to the people in Philippi, he wrote them a letter. And he said, under the law, I was blameless. What did he mean by that? That he never had a bad thought? That he never told a white lie? That No. What Paul was saying was, he was never accused by his own Pharisaical party of not following the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he told the Philippians and others, and that he followed the law very strictly as a Pharisee. And they were the ones that were always asking Jesus, is it lawful this? Is it lawful? Is it lawful? You see, for them, following and obeying and, improper, and properly interpreting the law was the way that you could tell someone who was acceptable to God and not acceptable to God. And then, of course, that led them to be very judgmental. And we will see in the Pharisees the same characteristics that we see in fundamentalist Christianity when Christology is made a religious form. But something came alive that hadn't been alive in Paul, and that is coveting. What does Paul mean that he went along in keeping the law until the commandment came, thou shalt not covet, at some point that revived in him. What was that that revived coveting in Paul that hadn't been there before, but there was a point when the commandment, when the commandment came, thou shalt not covet, meaning when it came alive for him. What was coveting for Paul? What was he coveting? All right, let's keep going because he's going to explain it. We're going to get into the heart of fundamentalism. And that's why we're taking time to study carefully the text, not avoid it. For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment. Again, what commandment? Singular. The commandment, singular. The commandment, you shall not covet. Well, when the commandment, thou shalt not covet, was an integral part of the law, sin in some way at some time seized an opportunity regarding coveting. And what happened, Paul says? It deceived me and through it killed me. Now, 
here's what I'm having or going to say rather about sin today. Number one, it's deceptive. It deceives. Paul was deceived. Here's a guy grows up at the feet of Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel, kept the law strictly. But yet, in some way, he looked back and he realized during his Damascus Road awakening that he had been deceived about something. And once deceived, sin, through that deception, killed him, which is the act of separating Paul from God. Paul wasn't killed biologically. He was obviously very alive and well when he wrote this. So when he says, and through it killed me, he means he was separated from God because that's the biblical definition of death. And look, as a progressive, what is it that we are all concerned about? And especially in the work I do with evolutionary leaders, we're concerned about paradigms of separation. And so there was something in coveting. He coveted something that deceived him and separated him from God, put him into a paradigm of separation. And so, bottom line, Paul says, is, yeah, the law is holy. The commandment, thou shalt not covet, is holy. It's just, it's good, but it was creating an opportunity, he says, an opportunity for sin to come only in light of coveting something. If you took that away, there would be no opportunity for sin to deceive and kill. So again, let's pursue. What is it? What is it? The question he asks next is, did what is good bring death to me? Meaning, what did he say? The law is good. Did what is good bring death to me? By no means. Law is not a problem. And again, as we go forward, we use law today, and rightly so. You must have law in order to have order. You must have law in order to avoid chaos, to protect, to provide security, to provide stability in your marriage, in your communities, and among countries. Did what is good bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good. Now, you want to talk about deception. Sin was working death in Paul. It killed him through what is good. Not, not through evil. It wasn't that sin, he was going along, and all of a sudden, sin tempted Paul to uh, steal something or to tell a lie or to get really upset and use one of those four-letter words. <laughs> no. Sin was working in death in Paul using what is good. What's good? Keeping the law. Keeping the law is good. How could keeping the law give sin an opportunity to kill Paul? Well, he said that this good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through that commandment, thou shalt not covet, might become sinful beyond measure. The increase of sin is directly related to coveting. Coveting what? What was Paul coveting? Hmm. It is here that we think back to the fact that Paul said to the people in Philippi, for example, that he realized he was trying to have a righteousness of his own, which is to say that because the law was the system that the first creation was subjected to, that because it was subjected to serving law, to meeting conditions and requirements by doing and what one was doing, that in fact, that produced in him a desire, a desire to have a righteousness of his own. And that was what was created by the law, 
when it said thou shalt not covet, the very act of trying to obey the law in order to have God identity and use your obedience to the law in order to claim God identity and look at all other people in the world and point your finger and say, I will tell each of you on the planet who is worthy of God's identity or God identity, and I will judge the rest of you on the basis of what I have done, on the basis of my obedience, on the basis of my keeping dogma, doctrine, and creed. It's doing. And what we're going to get to is that God identity is innate. God has always been in this universe. God was the source of it. And therefore, that means God is the source of everything on this planet, which means God is the source of all humans on this planet. All humans have innately God identity. Even those we've said and will continue to say many times over, it is obvious that many on the planet are not conscious of their innate identity. And they do things that bring about horrible pain and suffering on the basis of unconsciousness. And they are in need of an awakening. An awakening to that which already is. And so Paul is saying that the attempt to have God identity through that which is good. Isn't it good to try to be obedient? Isn't it good to be moral? ethical? Isn't it good to obey law? It absolutely is. Well, how do you give sin an opportunity? It was because in the first creation, the law was the only means by which one could seek God identity. This will explain the Christological action of God because where Paul was in that first creation was a developmental step whose purpose, whose purpose was to first teach in the inf uh, infancy of human beings right from wrong. Don't murder, don't kill, don't, don't bear false witness and lie and fraudulent and on and on we go. But it was also in their doing, it led them to think, that that's the end of the story, and that the whole point of a human being is to make sure they're the, the ones that God says you're doing good, and therefore you are okay with me. These other people are not. And guess what? You human beings will be the ones to tell the other human beings that they're not measuring up. And that's why fundamentalists are such a problem. I mean... Who out there doesn't know that if you say, I talk to a fundamentalist and somebody says, man, they're so judgmental. Would you, would you not agree with that? Of course they are. Why? Dogma, doctrine, creed, doing, keeping the law. It creates in a person a desire, a desire to say, I am good with God on the basis of my doing and keeping the restrictions and the conditions which are to say the laws. So Paul, I, I said I was going to come back to this, so I'm coming back to it. Romans chapter 8. The creation was subjected to futility. What was the futility of the creation in which Paul lived? The first creation. There are only two creations. There's that first creation under a first covenant, it related to Sinai. It corresponded to after the flesh. It corresponded uh, to the Jerusalem that existed, as Paul wrote. But there was a coming new Jerusalem that was going to transcend that creation and bring about a new creation. And in the new creation, there can be no sin. It cannot exist. Right and wrong can exist, but right and wrong are simply guides for our maturing in spirit. And again, to have an abundant life of peace and unity. That's the use of law, not to claim my God identity versus yours 
because even in fundamental Christianity, a fundamentalist who says it's all about you making sure you meet the condition that you've accepted Jesus and become a Christian, that's the number one condition and requirement. If you are going to have the grace of God, you, you have to meet the condition, are you a Christian? It's a requirement because if you're not, says the fundamentalist, you don't qualify for the grace of God. Well, this first creation was subjected to futility, back to the text, not willingly. It wasn't Paul saying, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd be glad to be in a system where sin could work through that which is good, and I could be separated from God, which is to say killed by it. It wasn't subjected willingly, but by the will of the one who subjected it, God, in hope that the creation, the first creation, will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Children of God, again, is what I see as identity. Christology is that which was the action of God to deliver humanity from the first creation, subject to law, and therefore the desire to have God identity through one's own good works, actions, etc., and to be set free from that, because we as human beings are frail and we have weaknesses, and those weaknesses will be with us till the day we die in some way or another. When you go into the glorious freedom of the children of God, you're talking about the children of source. Source determines identity. Christology is role and function. It is not source. Christology is role and function under the will of God. What did God want through Christology? For Christ the individual and Christ the body to model death to the self, death to doing, death to attempting to have God identity through what one does. What one does will always be a reflection of the degree to which one is either aligned with spirit or is in resistance to spirit. But nonetheless, it will not be something in actions, beliefs, ideologies that allow certain human beings, primarily in Christianity, dominator male hierarchies, to set the rules of doctrine, dogma, and creed that end up in hundreds, if not thousands, of denominated groups who will never worship in each other's buildings, never have any fellowship with those other fundamentalists. They will constantly be in arguments, and they will constantly have a spirit of judgment about them. And that's why you, progressive Christians watching this, are trying to distance yourself from it. Coveting and desiring God identity by making Christology a world religion that one must take on as an identity, Christian. Christian is the problem. And this is what Paul is trying to explain to the Romans. If you don't understand this, you're going to end up making Jesus an institution. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yes, and that's exactly what he said. When he wrote to the people in Corinth, he said, look, Christ can't be divided. If you keep going the way you're going, there will be a bunch of divisions. And what do we have after 2,000 years of Christology as a religion? Nothing but division, nothing but denomination. The very thing Paul said would happen has happened in every single case where he wrote to Rome, he wrote to Philippi, he wrote to Corinth, all the things he said. Look, this is what's going to happen. Why did it happen? Because people 2,000 years ago were just beginning the journey of Christology. 
And it has continued on to the point where now you are a progressive Christian because you have kept the story. You kept the biblical narrative. But you are saying that fundamentalist interpretation is the problem. I no longer interpret Christology the way fundamentalists interpret Christology. And we are saying we no longer at presence for myself interpret Christology as Christian. It is rather the action of God that moved humanity from the first creation to the second creation, and its time and place in history was the first century. Its work is complete. Its work is done. I am a new earth child of God. That's my identity. Now, here's Paul saying further, to the Romans, let me tell you about futility. Here's Paul's, here's Paul's definition about futility, and I want you to notice the word do, D-O. Watch this emphasis Paul puts that the problem is trying to have by law or dogma, creed, doc, whatever you want to call your requirements and your conditions, it's doing, it's some form of doing. Here's what doing is, is all about. Paul says, for I do not do what I want, which is to have what? To be one with God, to have God relationship. But I do the very thing I hate. What is the thing he hates? To be separated from God. And yet he says that the commandment, thou shalt not covet, comes alive when he tries to obey the law and do what is good because it has put him in a position of trying to have God identity through keeping of the law, which is to say through doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, which is to be separated from God, I agree the law is good. Why? Because I'm keeping the law. <laughs> I'm saying the law is good, and I agree the law is good, but in keeping the law, I do not do what I want. I do what I do not want. I create within myself a desire to be accepted by God through my keeping of the law, which is doing. And that was the futility that that creation was subjected to. But in fact, he says, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Sin can only be active and effective when one believes that the keeping of laws, doctrines, creeds, dogma, is that which provides identity. It does not. All it provides is the attempt to have a righteousness of one's own, which is self as source, not spirit as source. And that takes us back to the birth of Ishmael, which came through Abraham's self as source. And that corresponded to Isaac, who was born after the spirit, because God and God alone was the source that brought life to the deadness of Sarah's womb. God is source. For I know, says Paul, that the good does not dwell within me. Righteousness is of God and God alone. There is none righteous, said Paul. No, not one. And he further went on to say, let every man be a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar, every person a liar. So he says, the good does not dwell within me, that is, in my flesh. What's after the flesh? After the flesh is my doing. Galatians 4. Because the desire to do the good lies close at hand. I want the good, but I don't have the ability of myself through the self. And this is the futility of the creation that we just talked about in Romans chapter 8, that is the frustration. Now, I talked about 
sin has two primary functions. One is to deceive. The other is to kill. I want to talk about both of those briefly as I wrap this up on sin and why it does not exist in the new earth. You cannot covet in the new earth because when you move into it and you see the revelation of God that describes the new earth, you see that your identity is not based on meeting certain criteria. And that if you don't meet those criteria, God will send you and your children and your grandchildren into eternal torture. That's why you progressive Christians are trying to take on a different label of Christian, yet still identifying as Christian, which goes back to the root of the problem to begin with. That's why we're talking about it's time to move and make an evolutionary leap in our Christological understandings. So two things. It deceives, sin deceives, sin kills. Let's go back to Adam. Sin came through Adam. Before even Israel, sin came through Adam. What happened? Well, first of all, Adam could not have sinned without commandment. God said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. You shall not do it. Adam wanted to eat of that tree because he wanted to be like God. This was the futility of the first creation. To be like God is to, first of all, see God as other. You cannot be like something unless that something is other. To be like God is to keep the law without fail and by one's own actions to have righteousness. Impossible. Impossible, says Paul. Adam wanted to be like God, but there was a commandment given, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil represents two forms, one form good, one form evil, that have been behind the first creation's problem and now Christianity's problem. And it's who do you put in the box marked good and who do you put in the box marked evil? Will you be that judge who decides that? And then are you going to say that unfortunately God doesn't have the power to reconcile? God doesn't have the power to restore? Are you going to say that? Because Paul said God has that power. Now, back to Adam. When Adam saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye and that it would give him this wisdom, what did he do? Well, he broke the commandment. We say he broke the commandment. He ate the fruit. That's the sin. I'm saying no. That's the symptom. The symptom was he reached out, took the fruit. He ate it. That's the symptom. But what did he do when he looked at that fruit? He coveted. And that's where sin comes in. It's related to commandment and coveting. And what Adam did when given that commandment, he coveted. He coveted to be like God through his actions and to have control over good and evil. This is the problem of fundamental Christianity. They all are trying to have control over good and evil. And it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And it causes division, heartache, and pain to anyone who has loved ones like their kids and their grandkids who do not become Christians. They have to somehow in their minds as fundamentalists, they have to say, yes, there is hell. Yes, everything's on the basis of meeting the requirement. You must be a Christian. And unfortunately, my child is not. And I just have to know that's God's will that they're going to be tortured forever.
uh, to me, people are seeing in society today that that's the kind of thinking that if you were that kind of a parent yourself, you'd be put in prison for life. So this is the difference, you see, progressive Christian, in understanding that it's not about that. So you don't go to other people on the basis of being within the borders of some world religion. That is where the problems begin, is when you make something a form, that means it has boundaries, and now we have to decide whether the boundaries have been kept or violated. And if you're outside the boundaries, what does that mean? What does it mean if you're outside the boundaries? Well, the other thing is, and that is that Adam was told, the day you eat of the fruit, you'll die. He did. He died that day. He was separated that day because of his coveting. What was the outward sign that Adam suffered death? He was exiled from the garden, and that becomes a symbol of being separated from God. Adam wasn't left in that state. He wasn't left there. And this is the point of the whole biblical narrative, is that God is revealing the true self, the true nature of our identity, and that in doing so reveals to us that there will never be anything beyond the reconciliatory power of God or beyond the ability and power of God to restore. He did it to Paul on the road to Damascus. That is exactly why Paul was sent to the Gentiles as a model of God's reconciliatory power restorative power. Yeah, he had to be put into darkness for three days. There is a casting out before there's an acceptance. That's, again, Romans 9 through 11, and why dad wrote the book, my dad wrote the book, Irrevocable, that is dedicated to Romans 9 through 11, which comes right after this Romans chapter 8, by the way. You see Paul's building up into explaining to the Gentiles, you're turning Christology into a religion that you're either in or not in. You're making salvation something that applies to some, but not to all. You're setting up paradigms of separation. And so it did. And so it happened. The deceitfulness of sin was the deceitfulness of doing good. When the good you do becomes something you think is the basis of your righteousness, your God identity. So it's deceptive. Then what does it do? It kills. This separation from God is a killing action. Let's think about John chapter 8. Jesus said that the Satan, which I take to be our adversarial mind, I've done many podcasts on this. The Satan is not some devil with a pitchfork. It's the adversarial mind that comes from our instinctive self as source. The self can never have enough power. To be like God is to have the ultimate power. The self is all about protecting my survival. It's God-given. But if the self goes beyond its role and function, it becomes adversarial. The adversary, what does the adversarial voice say? Number one, Jesus said, in the beginning, the Satan was a liar. He was a liar. That is deception. Satan, how did Satan present deception? It was in the voice that said, did God tell you if you ate this, you, you, you would die? Why? That is not true at all. You will surely have this, this, or this, or be like God, etc., etc. That's the deception. It was a lie from the beginning, is that you as a human being can claim to be something on the basis of your holy righteousness that others don't have. That's the first deception. Number two, it kills. What did Jesus say also about the Satan? He was a murderer from the beginning. He killed. He killed from the beginning. Who did he kill? 
He killed Adam. How did he kill him? Through the deceitful lie. The lie that you could, on your own, grasp knowledge of good and evil for the purpose of being like God. And so, it brings me to the last verse I'll mention, and that's in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter. What an interesting thing that's attributed to God. This statement is attributed to God in Deuteronomy. See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God beside me. God is source. There's one source to this universe, a singular source from which all diversity comes. I kill and I make alive. Wow. I kill and I make alive. God subjected this first creation to futility, which meant that that creation had to suffer death, and that's why it goes all the way back to Adam and why Paul said in Romans 5, right before this, which I have not gone through, but Paul makes the statement, all in Adam are dead. The first creation in total was dead, separated from God, because even the Gentiles, apart from the law, still lived their lives on the basis of their own desires, which gets back to coveting. Coveting is desiring that which is not rightfully yours. I kill and I make alive. God says to Moses, thou shalt not kill. Why? Because we humans can't make alive. Only God can make alive. How does God make alive? Who does God make alive? God makes alive those who were killed, those who were put under death. And how does God make alive? through his reconciliatory action. That reconciliatory action was modeled by Jesus. He modeled death to the self through the cross event. When people were baptized into Christ and it was said they died with Christ, they were the collective second person modeling of death to the self, death to doing. What happened? What was the result? It was God's movement of third person cosmology. That was the result they were modeling. And what was it they were modeling? The movement from the first creation where sin could exist because people were attempting to have righteousness through doing into a second creation where God identity is universal to all people on this planet. And God and only God is the power of reconciliation, whatever that means and whatever that takes with regard to all that is. And there we have it. The problem that is so deceitful is the attempt to do good, not just to do good, and that's the end of it. The deceit is to do good and then to think, then to think that because we have done the good, that because we have done the correct things, that we have a righteousness that others do not. And yes, I can point to the most evil people that have ever lived on this planet. But one of the books I love so much is Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is, where she points out, there's my business, there's your business, and there's God's business. Reconciliation and restoration is God's business. How God reconciles, how did God reconcile Paul in those three days of darkness? That was between God and Paul, not my business. All I know is that God does it. How did God, how would God deal with evil and evil people and people that were, I know those are actors of unconsciousness, I know those are actions of complete unawareness that bring out the animal in our humanity that is capable of anything heinous, horrible, terrible, destructive. I know that. But I also know that all things in this universe are one, that God is one, and that God is all in all. 
not all in some. And it is God and God alone that has the power to ensure that God nature is purely a nature of unity. You cannot have unity on the basis of human agreement. It'll never happen. You cannot have unity on the basis of human doing. What you can have is deeper levels of unity, deeper levels of peace. But you will never get to a place with human beings where we will have unity in the sense that unity is provided from the source that precedes this universe. So progressive Christians, I say this in wrapping up today. I know this was longer than normal. I want to have more conversations with you because I love what you're saying. I love your heart for unity. But I do believe that as you continue on to call yourself progressive Christian, you're limiting the good things you have to offer. You're more than that. You're more than a progressive Christian. And this is what conversation I'd like to have based on the text. Because if we're going to say we're a Christian, the only place, the only place you can go for that kind of identity is from the biblical narrative. And for me, either the biblical narrative has credibility or forget it. I have no interest in it. So you can't take pieces of it to claim some kind of an identity. You need to look at the entirety of the story, all the chapters, and they're great. They're great chapters with great results. So I've gone on and on here. I appreciate your emails. Appreciate your feedback. Look forward to continued conversations with those of you who are in the progressive Christian world. The great news is you and I have an identity that's the very same as all others on the planet. And what you and I are doing in these discussions is trying to mature in our understanding of the identity we already are. Thanks for tuning in this time. I'll see you in the next episode.